This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for November 15th, 2022. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network feed or on our dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to, to donate to the show, click the links in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box that says sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one-time or recurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Mike Spears, joining alongside KS Lowe. Case, how are you doing this Tuesday? I'm good, Mike. As we as we plug some stuff up top, is there a YouTube channel that perhaps you would like to mention? Yeah, so I uh, this is something that really came together like last night. Uh, we're going to be having more of a presence on YouTube in the future uh, with the... Uh, impending possible uh, downfall of Twitter along with like just 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 in general like I with the way that uh, things are shared nowadays Twitter leads very it, like discussion maybe that's debatable but uh, actually as a like a driver of like interest not as much but we're we're gonna do something where we post clips we have one clip that we put up uh Yesterday, last night, it was from last week's episode talking about Dragon Gate's future. That'll be on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network YouTube page, I think, for this time. And we'll, we'll, I'll make sure to keep, include uh, links to these each in the show notes. And, and I think that's something that we're going to keep on doing going forward, just as, you know, if you all have maybe noticed, we, we, we've brought up uh, podcast platforms, rating and reviewing. That's actually the number one driver usually of this sort of stuff. So we're just trying to find new ways to kind of get out there for Open the Voice Gate. I think that's fair to say. I think that's very fair to say. I'm always amazed when I see the download numbers on the show. I'm flabbergasted at how many people listen, and I would love for even more people to listen. Absolutely. And if this is your first time, welcome to the show. Uh, This is going to be a different week than usual just because of the Dragon Gate schedule, because of... They've, this month being just frankly just absolutely front loaded uh there was no uh dragon gate network shows this last week and of course we have global dream happened two days after dragon gates november show in cork and hall we will be reviewing that but also and leading off the show wrestling observer hall of fame case uh, uh we've talked about it offhand but we kind of decided that this week is kind of like one of those weeks where we can just kind of feel ourselves a little bit, stretch stretch it out, and not just feel like we have to move on to something else. Let's talk about this year's uh, Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. Yeah, you and I mentioned it a little bit when the ballots were sent out, and for those unaware, I am a first-time voter in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame. Mike, unfortunately, despite a lot of people within our bubble getting added to the voting list this year— my good friend Mike Spears was not one of them. Uh, we talked about Shima about a month ago, and I, I think we'll talk about Shima a little bit more tonight. But I submitted my ballot yesterday. I did one piece of audio with friend of the show, Dylan from the Eastern Lariat podcast, and you can find that on the Eastern Lariat feed. I would recommend it. I get very nervous doing podcasts that aren't this show or the uh, Alan Forrell Pro Rest Paradise because I never really know what I'm getting into. But Dylan was phenomenal. I'm a big fan of the Eastern Lariat show when I need updates on the world of Japanese wrestling. And we had a very nice discussion uh, three or four weeks ago about the Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame. 
but I, I haven't checked back in with good old uh, Mike Spears, and I would love to know uh, what your hypothetical ballot would look like if you were to submit one. Yeah, like I had like all kinds of ideas, and this year has kind of, or at least this fall has been the Mike has an idea, he gets partway through, and then something happens. Like last last week, like originally, like one of our things we we're going to talk about this week was me getting to go deadlock, but managed to catch food poisoning and pull my neck within the within five minutes right before i was supposed to leave for that a but very mike spears injury i i i mean i i joke to the lady friend that i i hope she's all right in the future that we're probably living in a bubble because for my own protection a, just a compound to be specific not a bubble well, well a bubble within a compound of course of course right yeah yeah, yeah. i i mean come on here like this it, it, and it's not like the, the it, it's purely because i find ways to enter myself but yeah uh i it was something that i had an idea that i was going to make a big deal of like this is what my ballot would have been and then i other life happens and today and yesterday i finally sat down with everything and, and kind of pieced it out especially with the new uh rules that ha or the rules changes that happened this year and that completely in a lot of ways i think has forced uh dave Meltzer has has unilaterally forced his electorate to make a decision about his own hall of fame you know i feel yes. like that he, he in a lot of ways he basically said like hey guys let's talk about tag teams you don't want to talk about tag teams too bad because that's what we're doing this year uh, the way Dave operates in general is fascinating, and the Hall of Fame is no different to where he leaves so much up for interpretation. I mean, that goes back to when Brock Lesnar was on the ballot. You know, hey, are we counting his UFC drawing record? Are we not? And it was kind of just like, well, you know, may maybe. And the the tag team rule this year is certainly another, another one of those where it, it is such a specific thing that he added to the ballot and he really gave no oversight over it which is a really interesting combination and it doesn't solve overall problems with the observer hall of fame like it's just adding in a new issue it, it, it's it's seeing that the boat has taken on water but you're going like hey uh that deck chair looks wrong like the the, the like to me i i get like the concept because you get some tag teams and trios in here that should be in as an act but then you get issues like holy demon army you know? Yes. And, and, and when I look at that, I, that, that color is at least my interpretation of it. So for those who don't know, the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame changed their rules this year to allow for 18 votes between the four categories, U.S., Canada, Mexico, Japan, and other, along with historical North America. The thing is, is that in the first four categories, the current U.S., Canada, Mexico, Japan, and other you're limited now to five. So I know that like Cubs fan used to be a 10 vote for Mexico kind of person. That can't happen anymore. However, because there are so many tag teams and most of the tag teams got added into the historical category, that one you're allowed to have eight in. And as well, you're allowed five votes independent of those fifth, those 18 for non-wrestlers. But Case, would you like to explain what happens when you vote for a non-wrestler in the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame for those who don't know? So despite the fact that non-wrestlers are sanctioned off into their own pool, they still count towards the region that they belong to. So if you're a voter who only votes, you know, historical U.S. and Canada, modern U.S. and Canada, and non-wrestler, but for some reason you really want to vote for Joe Higuchi, who's on the ballot and was the famed All Japan referee from 1972 to 1990 – that would count as a vote for a non-wrestler, but it would also affect the percentages in the Japan category, which is an issue that I ran into when I voted for non-wrestlers this year. It makes no sense. I hate the way that Dave does this, but this is the way yeah. that Dave does this. Yeah, j just to be clear, like the non-wrestler category is my favorite category, actually, because you get figures in it that I'll get into when, we, when I introduce my ballot that I just find absolutely fascinating. But... You also have to navigate because there's one category I chose to stay completely clear of, and there's some non-wrestlers that if you accidentally vote for them, you end up voting for the other category. Yeah, it's a mess. But Mike, I I've talked a little bit about my ballot publicly, and I'll share it again uh, in a little bit, but I would really like to hear where your head's at with this. So I went full 18. I'm a big hall person. I've always believed in this case, and just – 
well, like, of course, oh, it is wrestling ability, ability to draw, and then historical significance are like the three tent poles here. I view historical significance in a way that might be a little different than others that I'd like to just kind of talk about for a second before I get into my ballot case. Yeah, please. So in, in, in case I know that that this is a common refrain from me, I feel like that there's certain things that like in the Hall of Fame, you're telling the story of whatever you're sanctifying, right? Like you go to Cooperstown and, and you're hoping to get an, an impression. However, with uh, Mitchell Report and everything else like that, you're not really getting the full impression of the history of baseball. You go to Toronto to the NHL Hall of Fame, same thing. I believe that for all intents and purposes, the Observer Hall of Fame has an ability to tell a story that should be, in theory, uh, lacking bias in a way that is not uh, the, that is not possible with, with other wrestling Hall of Fame. So I look at historical, uh, the historical category as it in the way that I look at the story of pro wrestling from, I don't know if we really look, look like. Uh, Abe Lincoln do it being like the catches can catch can champion of like the Mississippi River to today. If you cannot, if I feel like I can't tell the story of wrestling without them, then that that's a like full marks and historical significance to me. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I'm on board with that, and I use that theory myself. That is where I get hung up on Bill Goldberg, who is somebody who I did not vote for this year, but. He was my last cut and somebody that I spent a significant amount of time thinking about because I don't think you can tell the story of pro wrestling without Goldberg, but his career is such an oddity, and it is really hard to just define what it is that he did. And so I left Goldberg off this year, but yeah. I still feel like maybe next year Goldberg gets on for me. Yeah, and it, it, it's something that for me, like some of my picks, I, 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 they might be heavily towards the story of pro wrestling here. So I, I just that's something that I felt like I wanted to clarify up top before talking about this. Uh, should I just list off my eighteen plus four, and then we can get into the ones from that? Let's go category by category. All right. So just fresh off the bat. I did not follow European rest of the world wrestling. I did not vote in this category. I do not feel like I am at any sort of authority to have any sort of input in that. So way out of the way. Uh, Case, pick of the three uh, modern day ones. Which one do you want me to do first? Let's start modern U.S. Modern U.S. Okay, I voted four out of five. It uh, Junkyard Dog, the Von Erics, that is David, Carey, and Kevin. Matt and Jeff Hardy and Sergeant Slaughter. All right, run that run that down for me one more time. I'm sorry. Junkyard Dog, yes. the Von Erics, yes. Hardy Brothers, yes, and Sergeant Slaughter. Okay, let's start with the Hardys. This is a team I thought about a lot. I think they have a better case than some people give them credit for. I would like to hear why you voted for them. I think that we are seeing now, like. The Hardys, like peak Hardy boys, we're seeing now that people that have like like the last 10 years that not only just tag teams, but like individually have been just like wrestlers who are incredibly influenced by the Hardy boys. Like to the point that I think in a lot of ways for U.S. and Canadian tag team wrestling, the Hardys rewrote the books much more so than, of course, they get lumped in with Edge and Christian and the Dudley boys. But the Hardy boys, like they have that. And then it's the fact that I – and the, again, this is the historical significance thing for me. Like, there is a cultural component to the Hardy Boys that I think it's very hard to impart for people that weren't in a certain age range when they were at their peak in the late 90s, early 2000s. That I think is, and, and it, does, it carries some water with that just the same way that for like Slaughter for me, I think that the G.I. Joe thing is like a cultural significant touchstone that like you have to include that in, in a Hall of Fame. And that's outside of his tag team work with Don Carnoodle. I, I want to touch on that point real brief because the Hardys have not only their, their peak late 90s, early 2000s run, but they also have a resurgence in 2006 and 2007. And I can speak to this as someone who is currently 23 years old. There are five wrestlers that get mentioned to me by people my age when the subject of wrestling comes up. And it's John Cena. Rey Mysterio, Triple H, The Undertaker, 
and Jeff Hardy, without a doubt, Jeff Hardy is going to be mentioned by the the most casual, the most lapsed fan, the most I watched this for a few months when I was a kid with people my age. Jeff Hardy is on that list, and that is something that I cannot shake either when it comes to just general historical importance. Yeah, and it, it it's something that for me, it, it, and that like like you have like the tag team work, and you even have like the fact that like that last that last stint before they went back to the WWE the last time the time they were of ROH with the Bucks like were they moving around great no but were they like embarrassing themselves whatsoever like like were we getting pardon we weren't getting turned back the clock hardy boys but it was enough that you're just like okay this is the hardy boys in 2017 you know I would say some of their best work ever happened in the 2010s, whether it be in 2014 when they did the uh, Indie Resurgence Tour, which I want to touch on in just a second, or that ROH run right before they went back and really put the nail in the coffin in their careers. Obviously, the huge WrestleMania pop, but everything after that was pretty uh, lackluster from an in-ring perspective. But no, I, I thought they did really solid work as a tag team in the last decade. Yeah, so for me, like I get that uh, why they might seem like a weak hand especially matt but i think that when you, this is like one of the few people that like one of the few groups of the tag teams that when I'm, i look at this like yeah no the hardy should be in as the hardy boys not as matt and jeff separated whatsoever the thing that held me off from voting for them mainly this year and and i'm still not convinced that even if i dug into these numbers and i liked what i saw that i would vote for them i'm still not even convinced that that would be the case i think the hardys have a drawing record that deserves to be explored a little bit more than it is and it was one of those deals that i just did not have the time to fully dive into but i think that okay. I, I i witnessed their indie run in person I have seen houses that would only fill like part way in Spartanburg, South Carolina, get packed as much as it would during uh, Jim Crockett taping days because the the Hardys were booked. For what it's worth, when they brought in uh, uh, what was Matt Hardy's broken Matt Hardy, I, which I I hated every second of, and they probably shouldn't get into the Hall of Fame just for the final deletion stuff. But AAW brought in Matt Hardy in 2016, and this is the time when it's the Lucha Brothers, and it's Zack Sabre Jr., and it's Chris Hero, and it's Johnny Gargano, and it's every A-list indie guy that there is. And I was told by people in the building there has never been a merch line longer at an AAW show than Matt Hardy. And I think if you look at the 2014 stuff that they did in uh, Omega and in uh, Northeastern Wrestling with the Bucks and the Briscoe Brothers, that's the sort of stuff that really intrigues me, that I think as a headlining tag team on a small scale – this is a team that showed noticeable business increases whenever they were on an indie show to what you were just saying there. That's something that I think is worth exploring. I don't know how to quantify all of that. Uh, I am very much of the belief that drawing is contextualized or that drawing should be contextualized and that if you draw you know, 700 people to a building that would otherwise have 200 people in it. You deserve credit for that. It's not all about selling out Madison Square Garden. And I think the Hardys have a lot of that on their resume that I don't think gets talked about enough. I think people go to yeah. in-ring and influence, and I don't know if they get the credit that they deserve for a business uh, boost. Yeah, and I think that, like, that drawing contextually is, like, an ongoing thread, I think, as we go through the ballot. Uh, Von Eriks, I feel like that me voting for the Von Erichs case would be out of the ballot other than, of course, the ones you expect me to vote for. I feel like the Von Erichs, that seems like, yeah, Mike's going to vote for the Von Erichs. They've basically by themselves, like, like, like set up like a, like a, I, I mean, they were the representative of a wrestling revolution and world-class production wise. And that's not even getting into the fact that the Von Erichs were like not only insane draws in Texas and their, 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 their tours in Japan did not do bad either even with the the infamous with david israel like the like we're talking about global stars like at a level because of the syndication deal that world class had in israel in the 80s so i think that they're absolute no doubt like to me like i i would not put either of those three in by themselves but the von eric 
acts like this isn't talking about Mike and Chris here. Like we're talking about the three Von Eric brothers, the the ones that the, that would go to the Sportatorium every weekend, or would go to the would go to the Cowtown Coliseum in Fort Worth every week. Like it's and, and when you like you look at the houses they did there, like it's yeah, like their work and like Carrie as a worker it was always a lot more just like he was the the, the me head stiff that just kind of like slung things around there, but like. The three of them, like case, like how, like how many times will you watch like a world, like an episode of World Class in the Sportorium, and the Von Erichs pop out, and everything goes insane. And that's not, and that's not mentioning the fact that the Star Wars shows at Reunion Arena, like doing ten thousand at a time, where like people would always talk about like other like big territory shows, like they were doing these houses in Dallas Fort Worth, and that's not even to mention like. Yeah, the whole thing after David's death with Texas Stadium, like not edit, like you would hope that your linchpins would be able to sell out that stadium, like how Junkyard Dogs sold out the Superdome. You know, like it's just one of those things that I see that definitely as like marks there. But like the Von Erics are like the Hardy Boys, like people that are tailor made for what Dave has changed this to. I think that's a very interesting argument, and I wish I would have heard that about a month ago when ballots were first released because part of my hang-up on the Von Erichs was that I I had yet to hear a passionate argument for them until now, and I think the idea of wrapping yourself around the Von Erich family name in the context of voting for these guys is interesting. I still don't know if I would be there, but that is certainly the best Von, pro-Von Erich argument that I've heard all year. I'm surprised that there hasn't been like a, a a group of people that I think clearly you rank them Kevin David Carey like work world wise, but I'm surprised that we you look into like the business of the Von Erics and it was something back then because you're not just talking about Dallas Fort Worth and the size of world class was not a small territory like it was not just the Metroplex. No, no, they had TV all around the country. Like you said, they were a global success by one point. I, I absolutely think you're onto something there. That's a, that's a very interesting way that assuming they either don't get in or don't fall off. And quite frankly, those are uh, th- that's a list of names where I think they could do either. They could get sixty percent. They yeah. could get nine percent. I don't. I don't have a feel for them at all. But that is something that I will have to consider next year. Yeah, and obviously, like I have no sense of. Uh near east middle east like the uh, the area that at least like when we talk about the esports it's called it's called middle east north africa that whole kind of area there of like wrestling draws really that like the von erics are like one of the only ones that i'm aware of really Be- because you would you would have like you know iron sheik became the star after he came to the states like stuff like this but like not drawing drawing natively is what my question is and i think that's probably like a a greater historical question that that that's a Carl Sturm question. I feel like, uh, well, a- anything in his ballpark, more power to him. So I, <laughs> I, I, I will not be reaching out to Carl Stern, but that's, yeah, you, you can do that. Let's talk about Sergeant Slaughter real quick. Slaughter and Goldberg were my two, uh, last second cuts in the modern U S and Canada section. I, I will give my slaughter argument, which is not one that holds a lot of weight. And then I would really like to hear you speak on him because my slaughter viewing is very limited, and I, I binged a lot over the weekend. I really enjoyed what I saw, but my slaughter viewing is still very limited. I respect the argument that has been made for him as a draw. I try to wrap my head around the two influential notes that he has, obviously the G.I. Joe deal, and then the hearsay that AWA got on ESPN because of Sergeant Slaughter. As I went to type out my ballot to send to Dave, there was something in my gut that just said, Sergeant Slaughter is not a Hall of Famer. This is something I could be persuaded to change in the coming years very easily. I am going to make a a point to watch more Slaughter footage within the next year. But there was something that I could not shake, where whether it was my lack of knowledge or just an instinct telling me otherwise, I could not vote for this man this year. He is someone that has been like in the, like the forty to fifty range for so long too. Like I, it, he is not a fifteen year guy, is he? This year, 
Oh, that's a good question. Let me answer that for you in just a second. I'm going to pull up the because, email. Because I feel like he's going to always, because this is the same argument that, at least for me, like when I started paying attention to this stuff like 13 years ago, that was, I feel like that argument, if it was not being made in like 2009, when I started really paying attention to that, and we can make, you could count back and, and decide if that was a worthy use of my time. But like, I feel like that this has been the conversation about slaughter now going for like a decade he is a 15 year 50 percent guy yeah. so if he doesn't get 50 percent, he'll fall off and yeah i mean i've i've been following the hall of fame now for seven or eight years and i feel like slaughter dominates a large chunk of the conversation every year and there's you know little movement one direction or another but this is, is slaughter either getting in or falling off i think would just change the way we talk about this hall of fame because he's been on there for so long He's kind of been the gatekeeper, I feel like, because I feel like that there is a certain cadre I, of the electorate. I mean, there has to be because we see at this time that that he will take up a slot on their ballot until he's no longer there. And then there's people that are just not going to vote for him. So I, I the, do you mind if I get dark for a second? Well, it's the Open the Voice Gate podcast. We have to at some point. Normally, it's about mental health, but I'd like for it to be about Sergeant Slaughter for a change. The best thing for Slaughter, Sergeant Slaughter's uh, Hall of Fame case is if he passed away. Like, str- like frankly, because that would get a lot of the people who are, like, kind of uh, on the fence into one way or another. And that would probably be the bump to get him in. That is honestly, that is a fantastic point. I, I have no argument there. I think he, he is in desperate need of the death bump. So let's just go through the slaughter uh, case then, since it hasn't changed over the last 15 years. Uh, influence, as you said, G.I. Joe deal, I mean, pretty much doing that independently of the WWF machine at that time, leading somewhat to his departure and him going to AWA during that time, getting in that ESPN deal. Uh, work rate, uh, really, for him, it is... Like during the WWF time, he was already clearly on the downslope there. He was in a very agile big man tag team wrestler of Don Carnoodle. One of my, like, whenever I go through and watch stuff at that time, case during that, during your catch up, did you watch uh, the uh, cage match? No. So all of the slaughter stuff that I watched was either wwf or a little bit of awa and some of that awa stuff i had seen before and that i rewatched the all of the final conflict stuff i i unfortunately made the conscious decision to leave it alone because i wanted to sit down and watch that all the way through and i knew i wasn't going to have time and that could very easily change my mind once i sit down and watch all of that i have a feeling for what you like in that style of wrestling that alone would put him over the line so Final Conflict was this, lo- was this long uh, feud between Sergeant Slaughter and uh, Ricky Steamboat and involved also Jay Youngblood. Uh, Sergeant Slaughter had his group of, I forget what they called it back then in, in Crockett at that time, but he had basically like his training camp. I, I think it, it was the boot camp or something on that lines. I, I, someone's going to know and immediately get mad at me, but he had like all of like his, his trainees. It was like Private Jim Nelson, but like, the big one was Don Carnoodle, and Don Carnoodle is someone that kind of like has a little personal touch to me. He is like one of the more famous alums of my undergrad, uh, oh, Don solid. Carnoodle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like they, they had this long drawn out storyline and feud ending in the Greensboro Coliseum in a cage match that is, I think, for its time, one of the best cage matches ever. It is one, and it's called the Final Conflict for the NWA World Tag Team Titles. It is. One of the best, I think it's one of the best matches of the 80s, to be honest. Yeah, it's one of those matches that I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into. Obviously, it has a legacy uh, into itself, and it's an unfortunate blind spot for me, especially given the context of this Hall of Fame. Right, and and then going into like business side, you have to talk about G.I. Joe with him, but him as a draw on top, not ever the strongest draw never real i mean he was always the secondary in those wrestlemanias where he was up top like he was always kind of brought in there and in some cases was a replacement <laughs> so it the, like like drawing tickets is the data is not necessarily there though when you talk about gi joe and esp in there business wise i think you if you open up to a broader conversation he's a lot stronger candidate there as an influence yeah. All right. Well, I, Slaughter is at the top of my list of guys to really hit hard next year. Final one here, and we'll kind of move this along a little bit, but I, I was I found your list of U.S. and Canada guys to be very interesting. 
Junkyard Dog I voted for. I will reference the Rich Lotta article on VoicesOfWrestling.com and the thing that really sealed it for me in which he said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but if Junkyard Dog had done what he did in Madison Square Garden instead of New Orleans, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. And I read that and I said, he's absolutely right. And I voted for Junkyard Dog. Yeah, uh, it's it, like that's the best way to kind of describe it, to be quite honest. Like it, it, when you look at like Mid-South and like UWF and like what he was as like an individual, like singular star, like Mid-South in a lot of ways was built off a of Junkyard Dog. So like for me, again, the story of professional wrestling, you can't talk about Mid-South without talking about you can't talk about professional wrestling in the 80s without talking about Mid-South and what comes to mind when you talk about Mid-South case junkyard dog yeah so yeah so he uh, honestly like when i was doing this like he was the first name i put down which shows you my mindset when it comes to the hall of fame when junkyard dog for those who don't know is a very controversial candidate because of it is very much located in louisiana and mid-south with very few runs like a very short run in wwf not a tremendous worker and influence is non-existent yeah, very much so. Uh, let's go to non-wrestlers real quick. And uh, yeah, this actually makes sense because all my non-wrestlers are North America. Great. All right. So my non-wrestlers, this was, I only went four here. I couldn't get to five. I, I looked at some of the other ones and case, you, you know, which two non-wrestler ones, which I saw, like one of them didn't really make me mad. I could talk myself into it in a couple of years. You know which one made me kind of mad? I'm assuming it is Rossi Ogawa. Yeah, yeah, we've talked about that one. Rossi Ogawa is not on my on a. I understand like an argument like this, but they but there's someone else on the ballot that in, a, in the Japanese category I feel like is a better representative there for that. Uh, but I, I but yeah, but when I saw him in uh, Shinshiro Takagi, Takagi, give me like three more years, and I think like no doubt I want to see how Cyberfight plays out, like. I feel like that he is a little early for that, but like when like the biggest part of his career business wise is right now, if that makes sense. So I voted for Takagi and I think that's an interesting point, but I think being in a position to ha- be in place for the cyber fight deal was a, a, a compelling argument that Gerard DeTrolio made on voices of wrestling.com. And I for also, sure. you know, I talk about this a lot with Dragon Gate guys. First time we've talked about Dragon Gate in 25 minutes, but I think with the way the world works now, we underestimate how long some of these guys have been around. And if you want to start looking at DDT as a legitimate success around 2009, 2010, that's a really strong run for a promoter. That's a decade plus, And that's obviously not counting the first decade of the promotion when they were this, you know, underground little engine that could. I, I just, I, I think he's been around long enough to where if there was a singular face of Dragon Gate that was behind uh, all of the success of the promotion, I think I would vote for him. And Takagi is that for DDT, and thus he got my vote. Yeah, like that was the thing. Like when you see, I was like, yeah, no, you can never put Okamura up there. Like he was much more behind the scenes and money guy. Uh, it, and, and then it's just like at that point, you're like, you really like Ultimo would have been that figure, but then you have to explain the 15 years he was apart. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, you're absolutely fair. There. Uh, so my four were Stanley Weston, Ted Turner, Mike Tanay, and Reggie Parks. Fascinating. Okay. All right. Uh, give me your quick hits on all of those guys. So Stanley Weston was the founder of Pro Wrestling Illustrated. That alone should have him be like a no doubter. Why is he not already in here to begin with? But he was someone who also like worked at Ring Magazine as a teenager. Like was next door neighbor of the founder of Ring Mag- Magazine was doing like black and white was colorizing portraits as a teenager like in the in the in the depression. Yeah, like, that's that that's an impressive resume. Yeah, so like he uh, in fifty two years, I I am reading off his Wikipedia just because I think he, like he is someone that I think just for PWI alone he should be a no doubter. But like just like this fact, like so he was doing that at age fifty. 13 in 1989 and when he was 65 years old he bought ring magazine yeah that's that's uh i i was i was unaware of that specifically that is pretty impressive yeah so wesson uh ted turner i think that uh ted turner honestly if you really want to like take big picture and there will be people that will absolutely object to this i think he's had a bigger influence in professional wrestling when you look at a global stage than perhaps Vince McMahon. 
because of the superstation, because of the idea of satellite television and pro wrestling, the idea of now you're able to distribute cable systems and being the first person to realize it way before Vince McMahon. I'm completely on board with that take. I love that take. It is not one that I had on my holster ready to go, but it is one that I'll be ready to fire off from now on. I voted for Ted Turner. Uh, off of the logic you were using earlier of I don't think you can tell the story of pro wrestling without him. Yeah, and Mike Tanay, uh, I mean, commentator for, the, like, the voice of Impact. Like, I mean, to this day, like, whoever is calling it whatever, I identify it with impact and wcw i mean he as the third chair like giving the grab with us like giving like an actual like analyst role like kind of defining that in a way and that's not even getting into like his uh his personal archiving and like his relationship with lucha libre i i felt like that he's just like one of those figures that i mean when you look at basically 25 years of pro wrestling like one of the major voices on tv was mike tonight using his archive as uh, a spot on his resume is very interesting very mike spears of you i mean i've got to like put it out to someone who actually like doesn't put them in a shed yeah no you, yeah. I, I believe roy lucier has them all now yeah no and roy does good there, work there, yeah, there's, does. there's nobody that i would trust with those tapes more than him no no, no absolutely <laughs> not and then reggie parks reggie parks was someone that like I, I know the Jim Johnson argument and just can't put my name down on the paper for it. I just like look at like Parks was doing belts for like everyone for a time period, like imparting that. And to me, I think that that is like one of like those unsung people. Like I have a journalist, a business magnet, a a broadcaster who really wasn't an archivist and then a belt maker as my non wrestler. Yeah, I'm not there with Parks. I don't get that one. I I don't have a problem with him being on the ballot, but he just doesn't speak to me in any sort of way, shape, or form. I, whereas even you know a Tanay or a Jim Johnson, I th I thought about voting for Johnston. Um, I get those, and I I'm not I'm not there with Parks, but uh, I I do respect that. I had I don't know if I shared my modern U.S. and Canada, so I will circle back to that when we're done here. But I had George Scott. Uh, Morris Siegel and then Ted Turner and uh, who was my who was my fourth? Oh, uh, uh, Sanchiro Takagi. I Morris Siegel was like the one person that like I need to like look into them more before I, I do that. I'm very intrigued by him. Jesse Collins, who is becoming one of my favorite voices in wrestling for Voices of Wrestling, uh, did a write-up of all of the non-wrestler candidates this year, and I'll read uh, verbatim what he said, where he said, Moore Siegel, the promoter with the best case for election. Siegel is alleged to have been the promoter in Houston from the late 1910s until his death in 1967, when the promotion was turned over to his second-in-command, Paul Bosch. Siegel is not only the longest tenured, one of the longest tenured promoters in history, but he was phenomenally successful, turning Houston into one of the biggest cities in wrestling, along with St. Louis, the capital of pro wrestling during the 1940s, as the home for wrestling's biggest drawing card of the time bill longson in drawing some of the largest crowds of that era the territory also helped popularize blading and was one of the earliest blood territories and also created the texas death match the predecessor to predecessor to every no disqualification match used today yeah it like that's like the downside about like people when they're just like too far back you know because like you for what Jesse wrote there, like I'm almost to the point. It's like, well, I have that slot. I might as well give it to him <laughs> because there's enough there that like re that reaches out and like tugs at me. You know? Yeah, I, I read that. I read a little bit of what Dave wrote on him, and I, I read very little else on Siegel because that you know that checked out to me. And I said, well, God, I think it's dumb that he's not in. So that that was a pretty easy vote for me. And he was the one that fell into. He technically falls into the historical bucket, which is a shame. I hate to cost you know all of the wrestlers in that historical bucket a dip in percentage but i also i just think it's a little ridiculous that he's not in so so you didn't vote for historical i did not vote for historical but i did vote for morris siegel yeah so case now is not voting for historical but also is voting for historical that's why i said dave's not solving the big problems by no. expanding the votes uh uh spunnik moreau the vachans uh the bulldogs and tiger jeet singh were my historical gotcha i thought sputnik got in last year but i guess no. not no, Sputnik deserves being like, just like, just like the one act, like the uh, the uh, breaking it, uh, just 
straight up breaking segregation in Memphis alone is one of those things. But he also was like, have you seen Memphis Heat, the documentary? I have not. He is like Sputnik Moreau is like one of like the uh, like, I'm sorry, sometimes I will vote for someone on a vibe. Sputnik Moreau vibe guy just in general like he was like one of at least for that area like one of like the real like shoe like heels that was like i i'm a heel because i have a a evil because i'll break your arm in these submission holds kind of thing here and it just was like so cool like i and, and that's on top of the fact that i mean major star like not just in memphis i mean yeah that that was really where he was based up i mean you he went all throughout uh the he went all throughout the southeast i mean he had stops in southwest sports which was the uh, basis for world class uh gulf coast championship wrestling for florida mid-american uh and it's basically up and down that seaboard there and that's not even even getting to the point uh again of how he uh, uh broke down segregation as a civil rights activist in memphis I am f- a firmly a believer that he deserves to be in based on the work that Dylan Hales has done over the years. So I have nothing to add to the historical bucket other than my more single pick. And uh, we went a little uh, a little longer on modern U.S. and Canada than I thought we would. So real quick, let's move over to Japan and give me the guys that you would vote for there. Uh, Shima, Shingo, Hayabusa, Fujiwara, and Sadamura. Holy shit, that's not what I was expecting. Okay, all right. Walk me through the non-Dragon system, guys, please. All right, Hayabusa, I mean, he is someone that I feel like will be, like, mentioned to the day. Like, culture, like, outside of, like, the pro scene, like, 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 like the endurance, and I think a lot of this is, like, to, like, Bahu and people like this, and also, like, uh, a dark side of the ring. I feel like there's, like, an enduring kind of thing about, like, taking way too early, and it was something that maybe what would have happened if he didn't break his neck there. Uh, Fujiwara, I mean, he's a top 50 wrestler of all time in my books. So I, it, it's something that I feel like I've been intellectually dishonest not to have a, a top 50 wrestler of all time in the Hall of Fame. Is know? that is that That's interesting because I normally look at if you're a top 30 guy, which we obviously did this Greatest Wrestler Ever project in 2021 with Alan Forel. If you're a top 30 guy, I think you can get in on in-ring alone or come pretty close. And I use Chris Hero as my mythical cutoff of I don't think I would vote for Chris Hero, but I think if you're a better wrestler than Chris Hero, I would probably vote for you based on in-ring work alone. Yeah, no. And, and then, like, Mecha Sadamora, like, if you're looking for, like, the candidate of, like, after uh, the Joshi crash, like, the person that really, like, I mean, she came in in Gaia and all the way through, to, like, like, wrestled, like, a career that wouldn't have been possible during the peak. And because she did, she became the enduring figure. I mean, like, when you think about, like, I, I hate to, like, dismiss her or demean her down to the bridge. Like, when you think about, like, the figures that went from the uh, the peak of Joshi to today, it's you, you have wrestlers that were, like, far, like, retired and came back or people like Aja Kong that never kind of went away. But then you have, like, Sadamura that a lot of that is because of how young she was and came in during Gaia that she was able to kind of, like, get in and on those dying days of it and then ride that through it. And I mean, it's something that, I mean, you look at Senjo, you look at the fact that, I mean, I don't watch WWE UK, but for like that, all the work I was like watching at first, like leading up to it, I can't imagine that, the, that she uh, immediately turned into an awful pro wrestler with that, <laughs> like given like that. So I, to me, it's just like, I, yeah, Mecha Sadamura has to go in the Hall of Fame. So you're an interesting person to ask because you're both a Sadamura voter and a Shima voter. I see a lot of people comparing the two. And, you know, if you're going to bunch these Japan candidates together, you've got the modern New Japan guys. You've got your older wrestlers like Fujiwara uh, that kind of belong in their own little bucket. And then I see people pairing off Sadamura and Shima. Do you look at them as similar candidates? I get the argument there because... They, those two as a pair in concert are a referendum on like what can get into the Japanese category of Hall of Fame as an actor pro wrestler today, right? L- l- like that is the thing. It's like Shima represents being a male wrestler outside of New Japan or wrestling Mofa as a career in what's perceived as an indie. And then you have Sadamura who, uh, as I went, uh, as I discussed, like you have the, the fact that it was like Joshi was at the worst spot it's ever been in its career was 
during parts of her career and, and, and emerging from that as well. I, I, I get why people do that. I do find it that it kind of demeans both of their cases in a way, because I feel like that in a lot of ways, their cases are very different. Like Shima, you're talking about someone who had at least uh, 20 years as a top draw in one of the biggest promotions, and, and a promotion that went from indie to number two promotion in Japan, not by attrition, but by merit uh, for 20 years. And then, like, the thing with Shima is always like, I'm probably the person that he will always be a yes vote for me and always be a firm yes, but he's doing more and more things that I understand the argument not to vote for Shima. Like, everything past 2018. If things worked out a different way, he would have gone. He would have uh, vanquished a lot of doubts with OWE, but that did not happen. And that was the thing I I think that I can only speak for myself, Case, but I feel like you might be on the same page that OWE would have been the thing that would have been the trump card for him. Oh, OWE and an AEW relationship absolutely would have put him over the top. But I hate the argument that he's tarnishing his legacy somehow or you know, because he's working where he's working, that he's not a Hall of Famer anymore. The thing that I once told Larry Dallas, which hurt his feelings, and I, I used this to hurt him because he was uh, publicly talking nonsense about Shima, was that we don't judge Patrick Ewing's career based on his time with the Seattle Supersonics. When Ewing left the Knicks, he was an obvious Hall of Famer. And when Shima left Drangate, he was an obvious Hall of Famer. Nothing that he's doing now is hurting his candidacy. I would like people to look at the tape and look at the numbers in 2018 and 2019 when he was regularly popping houses to every promotion that he showed up to, including some dormant, lifeless promotions like Wrestle 1. He is still, to this day, alongside with T-Hawk and L. Lindemann, the only thing that ever drew in Wrestle 1. I don't like the comparison of him and Satomura because while I do respect what she's done for the Joshi scene as a whole, I look at her as somebody who was able to keep the scene treading water and to keep them from drowning and vanishing to exist, or and rather ceasing to exist. Whereas Shima is somebody that took a company that, you know, uh, has drawn well since the very beginning. And I, I often think that gets overlooked that Tori Monson show number one was a successful entity at the box office. And like you said, took this promotion to becoming the number two in Japan on merit. They earned that. They have the numbers. They have the consistency. They have the reach all over the country. They have a reach all over the country that no promotion other than New Japan does. And because they focus uh, and this is part of Shima's, you know, uh, uh, influence because they focus on such small villages and small towns that they have that. And that's why we see such a thriving dojo class is because to some people, the only wrestling they ever saw was Drangi because Drangi came to their town in Shima for so long was the face of that entire operation. And, and I had an interesting discussion with Chris Samsa and with John Carroll and the Voices of Wrestling Slack today. I think one of the things about Shima that often gets overlooked, and I, I want you to speak to this a little bit, because I don't know if you'll agree or disagree, but what makes him so special, whereas I think Satomura was on an island, not that there weren't talented Joshi wrestlers in the early 21st century, but Shima came in, and he had Sua, and he had Magnum Tokyo, and say what you will about Magnum, but he was you know a, a, a once-in-a-generation charisma machine, even if his in-ring didn't always match up, and Sua was an in-ring machine whose charisma didn't always match up, but then later on, he had Milano Collection AT, and Yoshino, and Yamato, and Shingo, and Tozawa, and on a roster with all of those guys, at the end of the day, it was still Shima's promotion, really through about 2013, uh, but it's not like he was uh, a, a hindrance to Drangate from 2014 through 2017. Um, this is somebody who was surrounded by greatness and was greater than all of them for most of his career, and I think that is something that often gets overlooked with him. Yeah, and I think that like when you talk about like the greatness here, like people also have to recognize the fact that it was not just like greatness that was developed it was it was prodigious greatness it was doing things and dead promotions like michinoku pro at that time giving life when michinoku pro dearly needed it after kai and tai deluxe left it very but, easily could have gone under right yeah so like and shima at that time in 98 he would have only been 20 
And in, in Shima 98, if you've never seen him, is a, in part of my language, he is a fucking animal. Yeah. My, so, my, like... my, my two favorite periods of Shima's career, this is such an odd thing. My two favorite okay. periods of his career are 1998-1999 Michinoku Pro and 2018 after he left Dragon Gate. For as great as he was in Toriyamon and Dragon Gate, my two like go-to Desert Island Shima years are 98-99 and 2018. And I don't know what two that's... Two sides of the same coin. <laughs> yes, you think about it's it. just... It, like, well, that's, I think that's why I like the Wrestle 1 wrestle one run so much is that he came in and his first match was against jun tancho and it's this three minute squash match where shima just kills this kid and it's the grown-up version of the angsty teen that showed up in michinoku pro like i love him as an outsider i liked his run in new japan this year so much because it it was kind of like he didn't belong there and i think shima reveled in that to some degree that is really the story of dragon gate is this promotion that just doesn't belong and they continue to be successful and i'm sure it really annoys some people they continue to have their success discredited because they are an entity unto themselves and for a long time it felt like shima himself was that way um i i just you know i said this on the podcast uh, that i did with dylan over at eastern lariat i think shima is the single strongest candidate on the ballot it drives me insane that he's not already in. No person nor tag team is as strong in ring, has the as strong of a drawing record, and has the influence that Shima has. He has all three categories, and I think he excels at all three of them in a way that no other candidate does. He's not going to get in this year. He's not going to get in next year. It drives me absolutely insane. You see, uh, the, this is where we kind of differ here. I don't think he's the strongest person on, on the ballot. I think it's Mystico. I think Mystico has been the strongest person on the ballot for years and that people just uh, just really damn him with the Sankara run. But I, I totally get where you're coming from. And to be clear, when I say like post 2018 for Shima, I am not someone that like does this. I just understand that for people that had him as a had a, we're on the fence i could see how that can come off like that for this I, I i do agree that like yeah he popped those houses the new japan stuff just did not work for me with him it just was one of those things that for me like when i was watching it i just constantly like you say like he was like the outsider out of place there it was so apparent there that he was like the old outsider to me and that like really bummed me I really like the stuff with Okada, so I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you there. Can you, as somebody that really only knows Mystico from the Sin Cara run, and then the really fun stuff afterwards, notably his Michinoku Pro 2016 tour, which I really really liked. The most obscure thing <laughs> to like about Mystico's career, by the way, Just like really... like we're not doing great in making this like a a, 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 a a very easy to get into show for new listeners. Just going the best thing Mystico's ever done. It's not the fact that he led an unprecedented boom at Arena Mexico. It is not the fact that he's revitalized his career back in CMLL. It's that run he did in, in Michinoku Pro after he left WWE. I just the best. It, it's it's so fun because Mystico wins the Mass League tournament in Cork and Hall and then just doesn't leave the ring. He just continues to put himself over in front of the crowd. And it's awesome. Uh, this is one of those deals where I probably should have given you a bigger heads up and you, you to give you some time to sit down and do this. But if you were to create a Venn diagram of Shima and Mystico in terms of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame, what would that look like? I I think the thing about Mystico that like it the the thing is that I think both in certain parties you have huge uh black marks on them i think that's where they overlap i mean mystico sankara run and then you have shima like i t it, it's something that like you look at it, it it's better now if gleet gleet's a lot better place but it was at, at a certain point you, you look at shima doing art uh, uh like art center wrestling and you're like what are we even doing here whereas you can go sankara and wwe and go what are we doing here yeah uh, that that is that is probably a fair way of looking at it. Mystico, uh, along with Moxley, I think one, one of the two uh, Flair Thez winners to not be in, and he just missed last year. Yeah, I think Mystico gets in this year. Uh, capsule uh, case for Mystico. Mystico led, again, one of the biggest business booms in recent Mexico history. 
and it was not like a short boom. It was several years of Mystico just being like the hottest name, and like and crossing over into uh, Mexican pop culture. Like it was someone like 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 to a level that was like his return as Mystico popped a huge number in Rio Mexico. Of course, he was Mr. C's, Caristico, and a lot of other various names until uh, Mystico Two, uh, the Munoz. Um, family member left the promotion. Then he took back over Misco One. Uh, his feud of his feud with Averno like was such a big deal during like that late two th- the, that mid two thousands run. And I think that like you look at Goldberg and what Goldberg did in the United States, Mis- and, and like business wise, like Misco, like it it's not dissimilar on a lot longer period of time. If you want to like really like drilled down to like the core facts about business yeah that has always been my understanding i've read a lot about it i've seen very little peak mystico work and that is something where it's a a mix like okay that's interesting because it's a mix of me kind of not knowing what i'm looking for but also not feeling like a ton of it is out there and that just for the sake of just understanding wrestling as a whole more that's something that i would really like to dive into at some point I think that if, and of course this will be CMLL, so who knows? Like with this, and I'm kind of surprised with like the way it is. I'm surprised that when he came back, there weren't like specials that they were airing of like of 2004, 2008, like Mystico stuff that went up on YouTube. Like that seemed like something that like they would have it all there. I mean, he won three straight Leyenda de Plata tournaments <laughs> during that time. Uh, he, here's how big of a star he is or was seen. So the Torneo Gran Alternativa in CMLL is a tournament where it's vets and rookies, basically. And in 2004, as a rookie, he won the tournament with El Hio del Santo. Three years later, he won it as a veteran with La Sombra. That's not bad. I think that, and then 10 years after that, 2017, Sobrano. Yeah, it's not bad at all. So, like, I just, like, the, I get people, like, looking at, like, that there. But he, I think that there's, like, been, like, no bigger doubt in, like, a, in a category in such a long time outside of Kazuchika Okada in the, in the Observer Hall of Fame as Mystico. Before we shift our focus back to the Dragon system, is there anything else uh, Observer-wise that you want to talk about? Oh, we didn't touch on Mexico. Like, like Mexico is all. Uh, all right. I'll list my other four. Yeah, give me your Mexico thoughts real quick. Uh, Sangre Chicana, Hermanas Denamita, Slash Los Capos, La Parca, AAA, and then Hurricane Ramirez. I am in the mindset of in a few years, I would really like to be knowledgeable enough to vote in Mexico. I am nowhere near that spot yet. Anything you have to say, big picture thoughts on the guys you voted for? I was sold on uh, Sangre Chicana by uh, Cubs fans, a uh, YouTube PowerPoint he did. Okay. I would I, I would refer people, like, if you're someone that's interested in this, because Mexico is, for our listeners who aren't aware, Mexico used to be the big dumpster fire because the electorate just could not get together and decide because you had people who were voting for certain things. It just was, like, different camps for a long time, and it was, like, the most glut. Like it, it was just like a lot of people just could not get over them. Like Mystico was like one of like the, uh, was like one of the beneficiaries of this. Like, cause yeah, like people like LA Park who are like no doubters to me or like Los Misioneros de la Muerte, you know? Yeah. And they Interesting. Get- All right. I have not watched that Cubs PowerPoint yet, but I'm going to get to that. That, that was something that intrigued me when it popped up in my timeline. Yeah. So, Case, you said you wanted to uh, run through yours before we move on to Global Dream. Yeah. Let's do that real quick. Uh, I, I voted in U.S. Modern. I voted CM Punk, Junkyard Dog, and Paul Orndorff. I would have been a Punk voter if he never stepped foot in the AEW. I, I'm always astounded at how few votes he gets, given that there was a time period in which he was the Macho Man Randy Savage to John Cena's Hulk Hogan. Uh, that's not even including the impact that I think he had in Ring of Honor, the impact on indie wrestling that I think he had as a whole, the impact on the way that WWE scouts talent and his in-ring work, which is full of highs and lows, but his highs are just about as high as anybody I've ever seen. We talked about Junkyard Dog. My only thoughts on Paul Orndorff is I will direct you to all of the work that Joe Lanza has done for him because that completely swayed me. Uh, We talked about my non-wrestlers, and so for uh, for Japan, I have Shima, Kota Ibushi, 
Tetsuya Naito, Shingo Takagi, and Akira Tawe and Toshiaki Kawada. I would have voted for Tomohiro Ishii had I not been limited to five spots in this category. Thank you for mentioning Tomohiro Ishii's name. I would refuse to vote for Tomohiro Ishii because they have never put Masaki Mochizuki on the ballot, and he is Tomohiro Ishii in all the categories, but much, much better. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about Masaki Mochizuki and Masato Yoshino, two people that would never get in, but two people that you and I would vote for if they were on the ballot. Yeah, so Masato Yoshino, let's just take care of him first because for a lot of the categories that I I know you view Shima as the number one pick for Dragon System. Like if you want if you're gonna pick one from the Dragon System, it should be Shima. It'll likely be Shingo Takagi. That's them's the breaks. Uh for me, it's Masato Yoshino because I think that he is a much stronger worker entering. He is much better entering re- singles wrestler than Shima. He is a not initially, and it is over a shorter period of time, but there was a bigger business difference when Masato Yoshino retired than Shima left. And I think that that is big. And then influence, I mean, case you wrote the article about his influence. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, whereas I think, you know, somebody like Shima has penetrated all corners of pro wrestling, and I think that's what's so intriguing about his candidacy. Yoshino is somebody who's work ethic and desire for perfection. I give the credit to him because he's the name that has always been mentioned when people talk about how flawless Drangate wrestlers are. And it's, it's, I mean, it's certainly not something that has perpetrated throughout all of wrestling. I mean, I, I feel like in some corners of the world, wrestling is sloppier than it's ever been, but in the context of Drangate, the Yoshino work ethic and the desire to be perfect into, as he told Mike Seidel, never fuck up is something that I think is really unique to that promotion. And it is by way of Masato Yoshino. Yeah. So like to me, uh, and, and like we didn't talk about this with Shima, but like the thing that's that helps Shima because more so than anyone else, that's like not named dragon kid or Ultimo dragon. When Western audiences see hear dragon Kid, think of Shima, they don't think of Masato Yoshino. No, that's a, that's an Western audiences when they think of Dragon Gate, they think probably what one Shima, two Yoshino, three Dragon Kid, it, Yamato in the mix too, and BB Hulk. People really love Ultimo Dragon. I I talked about this yeah. the the, fir, the very first show we did this year because Ultimo worked that New Year's Day Noah show, and he had some like I, some Ultimo Dragon sequence that I've seen a thousand times at this point. But it got gifted by the right people, and people just lost their minds over Ultimo still wrestling. And then that just happened on the the Gate of Destiny show. Somebody that nothing eight man tag. Somebody took the the screen grab of Ultimo's hot tag, and it blew up. And I just I, I don't get it. I I and I love Ultimo. I think he you know his current standing is no different than what Giant Baba was in 1990s All Japan. But goddamn, people love him. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and I think that, and and this isn't the place for this kind of t- tangent. I I I think that when you like see like that, because I I noticed that pop up case, and you're like, oh, okay. Uh, but I I think it it, it kind of like distilled that I, I don't think like as an industry, everyone has figured out how differently people consume wrestling than ten years ago, and I imagine that that's somewhat's in play. Do you just mean people no longer watching full matches? Well, that watching it, I mean, like, can you be considered like 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 levels of affinity? I know that with shoot job stuff, case you deal enough with P ones through P threes that <laughs> not to really bring that that up here. I, I didn't mean to cause any. No, it's fine. It's fine. Nightmares, it's fine. but like the the idea of like how you like measure measure affinity has completely changed, and like. Is it worth it if someone's just going to watch clips on YouTube, but we'll go buy T-shirts, but we'll never watch TV or go to a show? Because I think we see that now, and that wasn't a case ten years ago. Do we? Do you think we see that in mainstream North American wrestling, or is it yes. more okay? And, and I think that Ultimo Dragon having the WCW peak, and it's something. It's like, oh yeah, I remember him from back then. Oh, look at the gif; he still rules. Yeah. And it's just like, okay, this is the way you have consumed professional wrestling, which, you know, valid, whatever. But like, whereas we're sitting here and we're like, yeah, no, uh, 
I could show you a show in front of like 200 people in Kyoto that he does that exact same thing. You know, something that I, I, won't, I won't name them, so, something that somebody brought up recently is that I don't know of a lot of websites that do show reviews anymore. I mean, it that sounds weird to say because when I started writing for Voices of Wrestling, that was like the gimmick was everybody reviewed shows. They wrote their thoughts on every match. They gave it a star rating and they moved on. And now it's like that F4W recap style or I guess just a podcast or people tweet their thoughts. But we were kind of talking about how, you know, my Dragon Gate Cork and Hall reviews are not like that was the thing when I started writing them. And it's not that they're outdated. I actually think a lot of websites are maybe missing the boat. But like, do you read show reviews anymore? Oh, yeah. Like, do, do you read show reviews that aren't published on voicesofwrestling.com? Are there websites that you think excel at that? Uh, I think that I, I would take our cadre over most websites and people f who write for Voices of Wrestling who write elsewhere. You know, like I know I, I know that like folks like Suit are now work are now writing for a figure four. So I like read like because I know he does like NXT level up, which Deli delighted for, for Suit Williams. Nicest man in the world. Yeah, can't yeah, can't, yeah. can't imagine doing NXT level up recaps. No, no, no. But at the same time, I'm, I, I'm like, I didn't know this still existed. So, yeah, I've, I've read this and I think Su I think Suit's strong writer. But for like me, like like, like hey, it's like I actually need those like put together like spearsivations like formats each week. You know, like I'll read like Raw show reviews, even though I don't, I haven't watched Raw in seven years. Oh no, no, no! But it's like I read, I I read most things that pop up on VoicesOfWrestling dot com. I read Sagoon Nikeda because I like that they exist in their own little universe. And by proxy, a lot of weeks I read what Phil Schneider does on the Ringer. But I don't know where to read about wrestling matches specifically anymore. Yeah. That is just gone by the wayside. Yeah, and it, and it's something that like case even when like you came in like fifteen years before that like yeah. ninety nine like I can't tell you like I mean like Scott Keith was something that probably because you've been a creature of the internet you are aware of Scott Keith. I right? know Scott Keith. I really want between the sheets to do a Patreon show on Scott Keith, and I don't even know what that would look like. I just want their perspective on him. Yeah, because like Scott Keith came from the RSPW world, like the Usenet days where like people would just like post. And then you you have like people like him, uh, CRZ, Christopher Robin Zimmerman that like in 99, like like 2000s, like they would be posting like live, like like they would be doing like this, like on their message boards, on their websites, like, and it was like everything like four four one one one, like was like one was like the survivor of that era. In you know, and I, I don't say this to disparage the website, but ever since Larry Zonka passed, that website is not what it was. Right. But like there was so much more of that, like even like back in 99, let alone 2014. So like if anything, like Voices of Wrestling kind of like popped up and like inhabited a realm that did not necessarily exist as much anymore. Oh, I, I, I completely agree with that just because. You know, I, I think the people that that website attracts are, are not of the, the typical modern wrestling fan breed, which is always what intrigues me. And I, I, I've mentioned this on the show before, but I just I, I want to know now that Japanese wrestling is so paywalled, it's you know, it's it's more accessible, but it's also not than it, than it might have been a decade ago when I was getting into it. Like if you watched Forbidden Door. And you had never seen a New Japan proper show before, but you loved what you saw and you said, this is what I want to get into. I just want to know where you're going to watch this stuff and what you're watching and what you're using as possible historical guides. Like, I have no feel on, for lack of a better term, that generation below me. And I just want to know what is going on in that world because i don't know if you know if you and i are reaching those people or not i would like to think that you know there's somebody that that discovered drangate and you know the pandemic or you know even earlier this year or maybe through forbidden door they just got really into japanese wrestling and they discovered us but i don't know if those people exist or not i don't know if there's people that I'm sure there are, but I don't know if there's people out there that are like 1990s All Japan. Let's figure out what this is about. Yeah, like that. That's a thing. Like also because like the way that like social media operates is different. Like in 
America than it's in Japan too, right? Yes. So like, I I I you don't see like the screen captures or like the uh, the same clips that are in Giphy with with comments like from Japanese pro wrestling fans. It's just not like a thing there. Where whereas like there is like part of the conversation within Twitter, I would say with uh, uh with more uh English speaking fans. If that makes sense, for sure. From what I've, from what I've observed, but for sure, yeah. Uh, well, I'm trying to think of like so uh, Mochizuki. Now, I guess we should get back to Masaki Mochizuki. Uh, so, if you look at if you line up him and Tomohiro Ishii, and yes, this does sound dismissive when I said like don't compare Shima and Meko Sanmo. I feel like those cases are separate. I just like Ishii never has been more than Papa House and Tokyo Guy. Whereas you take a guy who I think they debuted in the same year also in WAR too. Like the like every single way you look at it, case, Misaki Mochizuki is a much better candidate than Tomohiro Ishii. I agree. I, I think you're a little harder on Ishii's drawing candidacy than I am. I and I think that's another one of those where Joe Lanza did a really good work and and kind of pinpointing where Ishii has main evented uh some bigger new Japan shows, but Look, I, I said this about Shingo on the Eastern Lariat podcast, and I'll say it about Mochizuki here. He could have wrestled his entire career in an empty arena, and I would still vote for him because his in-ring is just that good. I think Mochizuki and Shingo are, are two of the five greatest wrestlers to ever live, and that alone gets them in. But you look at the steady uh, top-of-the-card work that Mochizuki has done and Toriyama and Drangate since its inception. He has always been a guy in the mix. That mixed in with the in ring work i it would just i it would be such a no doubt of course i'm gonna vote for this guy even if uh there's not a super strong drawing record to show and uh there's not any influence that i'm aware of with mochizuki oh there's little influence he has his son now wrestling that is true then <laughs> the, the father-son influence is an uh, is an often underrated part of the wrestling observer hall of fame <laughs> i mean like straight up like what's more influential than that like if you're giving us these loose guidelines hell i i, I must have been a lawyer in a past life i will find a way to use those guidelines to my advantage to, to, to raise my case to do or plead my case case i mean what is what how can anything be more influential than a father and a son that's uh, and that's, that's beautiful that's really that's really beautiful mike yeah should, should we talk about something else that was beautiful at times at least uh, in kano's mind i i don't know if this show is beautiful or not but let's talk about it so global dream finally happened last week from cork and hall on the 11th uh Big picture thoughts. Uh, the written review, Gerard Detrolio did it on Voices of Wrestling case. Congratulations avoiding this one. Oh, so stoked about it. Thank you, Gerard. I really appreciate that. Yeah, so a uh, big picture. Uh, he Gerard wrote in the review, like, this was an interpromotional show that did not, like, have any specialness of an interpromotional show. And, yeah, that's, like, the headline here. Like, this felt exactly how I expected it to be. It was a pleasant time, but for, like, the build and like the interrupting like Dragon Gate shows leading up to this, I just was like, oh, okay, it happened. That the, the, there was a couple like things I was like, that's fun, but other than that, I just was like, okay, this was a fine Corkin show, I guess. So where we were right is that, especially after watching this show, <clears throat> I, I am certainly under the belief that Drangate was paid to do this show. And I'm not reporting that. I, I'm merely speculating based on conversations we've had with people that the reason this show happened is that Drangate was cut a check. And they said, well, you know, sure, why not? Where I was wrong was, one, the attendance. And I've been right on the money with Drangate attendance numbers lately. I, I feel like I have a very good feel for the promotion right now, a very good feel for what's over and what's not. And you and I were both uh, off on this. I, I think you said below 800. I said right around 800. And this show did 1209, which is Ooh. a really, really good number. and almost doubles the best Noah Cork in attendance of the year, which was done the day before with Kiyomiya versus Timothy Thatcher in a GHC World Heavyweight Championship match and El Hijel del Dr. Wagner Jr. versus Matsukatsu Fanaki in a GHC title match second from the top, not to mention the fact that there were three other title matches on that show 
including Kojima and Segura versus uh, uh, Katoshi Saito and Muhammad Yone. That show did 789. That was their best Corkin number this year. This show does 1209. And that, to me, is just a very bad look for a pro wrestling Noah. Uh, wh- where do you stand on that? Oh, I think this is a massive indictment of pro wrestling Noah. And I think it leads so much credence to the fact that this was like a, th- this was like basically a, a Dragon Gate show where nothing happens in Dragon Gate canon that was put on in Wrestle Universe, toss on with some various uh, Noah guys. That's what the show was. And the fact that, that that this almost doubles the show they had two nights before with Dragon Gate really not doing much building towards this whatsoever. Like, like I don't know how you could... Like, yeah, congratulations. You, you're what we both think... Uh, think. Like, I have a pretty strong feeling that this is was a sold show. Can't report it, but it just feels like it. And the conversations that we had have, like, led credence to us. And it's like, well, congratulations. You bought a successful show. It, it's, such a, it's such a bad look when you think about how they launched the angle for this show on a Dragon Gate show in Osaka. They did like a little press conference deal at the Dragon Gate Cork and Hall show two days before this, but really it was just, it was entirely promoted on the Noah side. And, and I want to be clear, I'm going to be harsh on pro wrestling Noah in a few different aspects of this review, as I normally am, because I just, I, I don't enjoy the current Noah product. And that's not to say that I, I never have. I, I really like them in 2020. I've, really like them a lot over the last decade. I really don't like 2022 Noah. I have a number of issues with it. And for this show to draw what it did without like a really strong Dragon Gate angle on it, just the idea that Dragon Gate guys are going to show up and that should be your draw to buy tickets. And for the fact that that worked when Kiyomiya versus Thatcher did 789 in Cork and Hall the day before. And you can't say, oh, well, it was it was a Timothy Thatcher GHC title defense. Who cares? Because that was the best number they've done in Cork and Hall. Like they are just in a in between a rock and a hard place in any way you look at the numbers for this show. It's just a really bad look for Noah in the Tokyo area. The thing that I, I was also wrong about was that I thought this show was going to be much better than it was. It's very interesting to me when promotions use the Dragon Gate name or use Dragon Gate and then don't use what makes Dragon Gate special. And this was very much a pro wrestling Noah show with Dragon Gate wrestlers on it. And if you think back to Dragon Gate USA, you know, what are the Dragon Gate USA shows that people love? It's the first four, and it's the show with Gargano and Shingo in the main event, WrestleMania weekend. And why do people love those shows? Because they felt like Dragon Gate shows. And when people think about the worst of Dragon Gate USA, they think of it as a bad US indie show that happens to have some good Dragon Gate wrestlers on it. And this Global Dream show had a little bit of that vibe where it was a Noah show that just happen to have some wrestlers that I really, really like on it. But the atmosphere, uh, despite the fact that it seemed to be packed with Dragon Gate fans, the way the show was presented was much more in the Noah style than it was the Dragon Gate style. Yeah, like the only thing that did not make this like just like a one-off show was the fact that they the uh, promo afterwards with with Kano and Kota Minoru, where Kano was like, anytime you need me, because you're cute and I, I'm angry and I want to be with you. But uh, the the only like storyline was building up the one uh, one match between Kano and Kiyomiya. Like it was like distinct, like its own thing, and you could tell like case. Uh, now that we get like a chance to see like house show matches, and we can see like okay, like the main event house show matches. Like we get like a new angle here, and they're always really trying for this. But then like some of the other like house show stuff, you can tell like okay, like doing the the crowd appeal stuff like that. Like there was a whole lot of we're going to do humorous stuff because we because we just had a big show two days ago and a pay-per-view three days before that that kind of came off to me with this like this came off like like we're gonna have a good time with this being at the end of a long week and effort i mean there was effort in some things but it just felt like a lot of it was we're, we're gonna send these this crowd happy and it accomplished that but it just does not always make for a most interesting show to watch no there was one match on this show that i really liked and 
it, unfortunately, it was the match that felt most like a Dragon Gate match. It was the semi-main event, whereas a lot of this show, to your point, just kind of felt like, I, I don't want to say standard junior heavyweight wrestling, but it was like watching Dragon Gate guys not shift into high gear. And so it just it just became bland junior heavyweight wrestling. I, I think the Noah Jr. division is so interesting because obviously it's been booked horribly for years now. And I, I think anybody that tries to defend it is a dope the same way that I, I now feel about their heavyweight division as well. But Mike, what's the reputation that DDT has in Japan? Oh, it's the indie promotion. It, it, it's wrestlers that aren't good enough to wrestle anywhere else. That's where they go. DDT, correct? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, it, they're slowly changing that with uh, changes with Yunakiyama, but yeah. I just feel like the Noah Jr. division is the actual living embodiment of that. It's a bunch of guys that I like, but not guys that I would want to build a division around. And watching this show is like, I, I I don't know. I just felt like some guys were were outclassed. Um, I specifically the foreign junior talent that was on this show. Oh boy! <laughs> I, you know, I actually the thing is, I think Dante Leone is a decent wrestler. I just I, he has such a bad look that it's distracting. I I you see, I thought he looked awful in this match. I I, I will say, well uh, well. well uh, my thought was goddamn natural vibes is even better than I thought. Like I always say you, you, you could put Jason Lee in any promotion in the world. He would immediately be the best junior. And then you watch him against Katoge and Dante Leone and you go, Oh my God, Jason Lee might actually be better than I thought he was. And I already think he's one of the better wrestlers in the world <laughs> like that. Jason Lee, UT and strong machine J should just run rough shot through all of Japan. That is a winning trio. Yeah, no, that was like the the fun part of the match, but that was the point of the show where my first note for that match was, "What are we even doing here?" Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I let's let's start from the top. I have, yeah, I have a number of things I want to say. All right, the opener was Yoshiki and Amora, Yosutaka Yano, and Kai Fujimura of Pro Wrestling Noah defeating Mochizuki Junior, Madoka Kakuda, and Ryo Fuda. 11 minutes and 55 seconds with a Oklahoma Stampede by Enamura on Fuda. Uh, Yano and Fujimura, are they, like, I I got the sense, and I will say this, like, I am, if, if Case keeps Noah at a distance, I don't even let in my zip code. So I, I, I was going to ask, you You probably haven't seen a lot of these guys wrestle before, have you? No, I haven't. Uh, Enamora is cool as hell. I yes. like Inamora. Yes. In 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 and you pointed is, that out. Inamora is out. fucking awesome. Um, <laughs> Crazy look. His gear is awesome. Just throwing people around. I like Inamora. He is tremendous. Yeah, it, it's a shame that Inamora is in the time and place that he is. He's the guy that went after Kenta on the New Year's Day show. It was a six-man tag. It was Daike Inaba, who I really like, Masa Kitamiya, who... God bless him. I I wish he was in another promotion. Uh, and Inamora against Sakuraba, Segura, and Kenta. And Inamora went right after Kenta, and it rocked. And ever since then, he's been a guy on my radar that I I really enjoy when I watch him. Yeah, no, he 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 pops off the screen like it, it, it's something that like I know Muhammad Yone. I've seen Muhammad Yone for like twenty years at this point, but he's still someone who like kind of pops off the screen. Whereas like Yano and Fujimura like. I, I mean competent but just were there you know like but i mean at that point in the career like you kind of got to see that the, the difference in training styles and booking philosophies in the first match if you think about it oh god i mean i one i was disappointed that kakuta and inamora were in this because i just i, I would have liked for them to either have a singles match or for them to just do something different because i felt like both of them were above working with Yano and Fujimura, even though in his own promotion, Inamura is constantly working with those guys. But you look at Fujimura, who I, I think has potential, and Yano, who was there, and then you look at Mochizuki Jr. and Ryo Fuda, and it like it's just a different planet. I mean, Fuda could be thriving in pro wrestling Noah right now. Uh, the the Dragon Gate rookies were just so far a level and above what, where the Noah guys were at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, five-way elimination tag was. And, and I should say real quick on that opener, 
uh, one of my favorite matches of the night. I would I would say top three, maybe my number two. Yeah, I would say, yeah, no, I enjoy this. There are other matches that were technically better that I did not enjoy as much. as. Yes, I think that's a, a very apt description. Tag team five-way elimination match. Manabu Soya and Ishin defeated Muhammad Yone and Big Boss Shimizu. And then the other three teams in the match were the M3K team, Susumu Mochizuki and Azushi Kanda, Eita and Super Crazy for Paios del Mal de Hapon, and Benkei Minorita from Gold Class. I talked about this last week. I just don't understand how you can do a Drangate Noah show and not heavily feature Eita and not even book Masaki Mochizuki. And for this to be Eita's match, teaming with Super Crazy, who I have a real soft spot for, but for this to be Eita's match and for him to be eliminated in seven minutes by the Ishin Minorita tag team, I just don't understand that at all all that that is the most confused this entire thing has made no sense to me i don't get this partnership but for eita to be in a meaningless match and for mochizuki to not be there i i will never understand that yeah and eita for this match uh him and super crazy walked out spent their entire 60 seconds between their entrance and the next person's entrance walking around ringside so like he really had like two minutes worth of work it's it's mind blowing, uh, and I, I don't know. I thought I you know the match was fine. I, this, Jokey, yeah. It was just it was really a vehicle for Shimizu and Yone, which I don't even mind because I thought it was a fun pairing. But the the Ata thing is truly baffling. I mean, such a non entity on a show that realistically, if he wasn't going to headline it, he should have been in the semi main event in a big spot. Yeah, uh, this was kind of just there to get people on the show. I didn't care for it at all. Uh, we had uh, Natural Vibes, KZ, and Jackie Funky Kame, along with Yohei, uh, defeating Ryo Saito, Ginky Horiguchi, and Nosawa Rongai with a horizontal crate with a horizontal cradle on a onto Nosawa. The uh, the big thing was that GM Ryo Saito got sick of Nosawa's shit. He elbowed him in the face, and Yohei was right there to roll him up in a match that uh, I. I, it, it's hard for me like like i'm one like i i guess like yohei is always going to be like a figure that for me i just is difficult to like kind of give an opinion i guess i i don't even want to do no zowl bits i yeah i just i did not like this at all i you know i thought yohei looked fine i i would really i would like to see yohei and gleet I think it, he is it such. Does he, seem like his like spiritual. Yeah, um, he is such a bad fit in Noah. Watching him here, I was like, God, I I think there's a good wrestler inside of there, but it's just it's never it's never going to happen in Noah. He's not right for all Japan. He's obviously not New Japan caliber. I don't I don't think DDT is the spot for him because I think he's just going to be with a lot of guys on his level in DDT. I think him and Gleet would be really interesting, though. Yeah, I just, yeah. It's just one of those things that, like, Yohei, I'm, I feel like I'm always going to kind of have that with him, that I'm just, like, whenever he's on screen, I'm just not interested, so... <laughs> uh, no, no no argument from me, my friend. Yeah, uh, the the, the seven-person natural vibe dance was fun. I'll say that. Oh, yeah. The, no, absolutely. The best thing on the show was next, though, Case. It was Kona Mao... Konamama Ichikawa versus X, and there's only one person who could have been X, the biggest X of all time. It was Satoshi Kojima who defeated Konamawa Ichikawa with a brutal Western lariat in four minutes and 22 seconds. I love that they finally paid off Satoshi Kojima as being X for those that don't know the story. I, I forget when exactly Kojima made the move to Noah this summer, but he was hyped up as this big X, and uh, people weren't sure if it was going to be him turned out to be him and then the joke was that every x going forward was going to be satoshi kojima uh jay thought when we did our kobe world preview that the x versus ichikawa there was going to be kojima turned out to be keiji muto uh but here we finally get the big payoff of kojima versus ichikawa and masterclass masterclass this was the most dragon gate feeling thing on the show yes absolutely that 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 is probably true just because there is a timeless quality to Konamami Chikawa. 
Yeah, and you know, it was four and a half minutes. It was exactly what you expect if you've never seen. Like, there was like a weird backlash against Ichikawa on social media. Did you see that? I did not. Yeah, like I was like seeing like because like Satoshi Kojima like did a tweet. Like I've seen the tweets. Uh, Ichikawa was actually a brilliant wrestler, and I guess there was like a backlash of like Noah fan base. Like thinking, of, like not getting that this is Komao Ichikawa's gimmick is for the last thirty years he's been the weakest wrestler alive. That that's who he is. Factoring in the native fan base and the English speaking fan base, what sports franchise compares to pro wrestling Noah's fan base? Oh boy, Knicks. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Something to think about. I would like people's. I, I would like people's thoughts on that. What sports yeah. franchise uh, fan base is similar to the Noah fan base? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Uh, the next match, I don't know why everyone still has as Yosuke Samari in this. Like, I, I'm looking at lineups that have listed Yosuke Samari in this match. She was not part of this match. Yosuke Samari is, uh, there's injuries. Uh, but uh, we did have Natural Vibes, UT, Strong Machine, J, Jason Lee, as Case was talking about before, uh, versus Sushi Toge, Dante Leon, and Punch Tomonaga. It was the Inferno a Cancun Tornado that uh, uh, that Dante Leon did on Jason Lee to win. I did not like seeing Jason Lee take this pinfall. I did not like it one bit. I did like seeing him wrestle at Sushi uh, Katoge. Uh, Katoge, another one of those guys where he's obviously bounced around a little bit, was Osaka Pro, now Pro Wrestling Noah, and another guy that I think would be a wonderful addition to the Gleet roster if he ever decides to make the jump. I like the Katoge and UT parts. Yes. Yeah. No, I, again, this it, this match served the function of proving my theory correct that the natural vibes guys are all just so talented and that if they were in any other promotion, I mean, I, you know, you and I consider them to be some of the best wrestlers in Drangit anyways, but in another promotion, they would just jump off the screen to such an alarming degree and seeing UT wrestle Katoge here and Katoge was good. But seeing UT and Jason just do their work against him, it was just like, God damn, these guys are on another level. Yeah, no, it, it it was a tremendous natural vibes performance there. Uh, Absolutely, the singles match on the show and the first match made for it was Yamato defeating Seki Yoshioka in 13 minutes and 14 seconds with the Galleria. In case I know that we went and watched all of Yamato's stuff for the most part when he was in the United States, I think I'm good with highlight Yamato singles matches for a while. This just wasn't any good and i i don't i i don't know what it was because i think individually yamato and yoshioka were fine but i felt like there was zero chemistry between these guys it was like zero chemistry and then exacerbating that by just working like the first 10 minutes of a yamato dream game match but on repeat for this entire like the gallery like came and went and it wasn't a very good gallery and i was like oh okay but it felt like I was just like watching an opening like Yamato Matt work for 13 minutes. This show is so odd because, you know, I thought the opener was pretty fun. And then you get, you know, the the big tag match, which was nothing. And then the vibes match, which wasn't anything. You know, Kojima Chikawa was fun. And then the vibe six man, which was nothing. And you kind of would have hoped that the show would have really cranked up a level with this match. And then it didn't. And when it didn't, I just got very annoyed that I had to watch this show. After that, uh, we had the interesting uh, pairings. This was Takuma Fujiwara's last appearance in Japan during this trip. He is back in Mexico. I think he actually is back wrestling in Mexico next weekend. But he teamed with Amakusa, uh, defeating Shun Skywalker and Tadasuke when Amakusa pinned uh, Tadasuke with a modified crucifix clutch after a whole bunch of like rolling around and trying to act uh, tricky with it. I like how, but I don't think this is it for him. No, no. I thought this was a match where Shun and Fujiwara looked really good and the Noah guys did not. And again, I, I don't say that to purposely be antagonistic towards pro wrestling Noah. I just, I think a lot of the wrestlers got outclassed on this show. And this was one of the matches that was glaring to me where you had two Noah wrestlers who were just not on the same level as Skywalker and Fujiwara. Yeah, and like there was like a... Th- 
uh, like the story was Tadasuke wanted badly Shun Skywalker to be like on the same page to be teamed and like the Shun did not want anything to do with him and like there was like even a like in the closing stretch Tadasuke completely blew like he was supposed to like get up there like Shun was doing a taunt before he was going to do his uh drive by Yakuza kick in the corner but uh, Tadasuke was supposed to jump up there and immediately like pose and go for it while Shun was taunting and blew that spot completely blew it right yeah the I, I, and, and that was you know there there was a level of quality to the work of Fujiwara and Skywalker that I just don't think was there for the Noah guys I mean I thought Shun looked great you know him monkey flipping uh uh it was a uh, uh how into Fujiwara I, I thought that looked awesome there there was a number of Shun spots that I really liked here but the, the match as a whole it was just another one of those matches where I'm looking at my notes I go okay well three stars here three stars here you know two and three quarters here and then I you know I've got this match at three stars it's like oh god this this show is not any good yeah and it was something that even like Fujiwara doing like incredible stuff that we're so used to it does not pull it out at this point like at this point like case we should have known the show was not for us if we didn't already know no again it was it was a pro wrestling noah show that just happened to have some dragon gate guys on it i mean that's really how it felt and that led on even more so towards the semi-main event uh this was probably my favorite thing on the, the show it was a heel team of z Bretts and congo with hulk uh, Hio Diamante, Hiroki, and Hajime Ohara versus the combined babyface side of Dragon Kid, Dragon Daya, and his mask, uh, Alejandro, Extreme Tiger, and Ninja Mac. It was Ninja Mac with the Ninja Bomb on the Open the Brave Gate champion, Hio. My match of the night, I went three and three quarters on this. I thought this felt like a Dragon Gate match, but it also felt like the spirit of what this show should have been, where... Alejandro and Extreme Tiger and and Congo and you know kind of Ninja Mac bought into wrestling like an all star style match and I I thought this was a ton of fun even if Ninja Mac as a wrestler is just not for me I think the look is terrible and you know he botched a spot with Diamante early and even if the high spots are impressive I mean I I, I really think he's more suited for jersey all pro than he is pro wrestling noah but he seems to be working there more power to him you know the 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 audience seems to like him but he was a distraction of what i thought was otherwise a really good match in my notes i think it's the best way to describe this match in my opinion fully impressed with those i wanted to be impressed by which for you means alejandro yeah alejandro looked great yeah he's, he's, he's a really good wrestler he he's a really good wrestler. Uh, I coming out of the show is the same time, the same opinion I have whenever I see a Dragon Gate wrestler, wrestler Alejandro, and that is, man, I wish Kondo brought him like as a part. I, like he probably could have fit in like his roller bag, just bring him, just like slide him into that Kyoto debut show. It's like, hey, uh, this is Alejandro. I brought him too. Uh, he can go wrestle punch. Is he the guy that you would most like for uh, Dragon Gate to steal if they had the opportunity to? Off of just the Noah roster? Oh, off of this show, yeah. Oh, undoubtedly, yeah. Uh, like Kano is Kano. Like I, though I feel like Kano makes sense, and no, I wouldn't take that. I think Alejandro and Dragon Gate is would be great. Alejandro, Inamora, Kano. Although Kano's thirty seven years old, can you believe that? Yeah, man, Kano is like uh, he's pulling off the angry teenager act way later than one would think. Uh, uh, my, my big Ninja Mac moat no it was him versus diamante was a bizarre delight for the reasons you listed yeah as you know the the best base in the world and then this completely unpredictable uh gcw american backyarder and it you know mixed bag again the ninja mac high spots look really really good but it's the in between that i i really don't think he's there and i'm so surprised to see him uh, being booked on the level that he's booked at but all in all this was a very good match this is the one that if you were going to watch anything from this show this is what i would watch i am a little bothered by hyo taking the fall here yeah yeah to ninja mac i mean they're not gonna they're not gonna pin hulk they're not gonna pin diamante and i didn't seem like they wanted to pin their own guys so hyo luckily i think he's teflon and i don't think it hurts him but i i, I was bothered by Dante Leon pinning Jason Lee, and so it makes sense that you're bothered by Ninja Mac pinning Hyo. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the reason that, that Hyo had to take the fall here, so the answer is book a better match. Book people that you actually can drop falls who aren't uh, singles champions. No argument from me. At, at least uh, Ninja Mac is clearly, like, and it is listed, I think, above 82 kilograms, so I don't think he gets a title shot off. A lot of old wrestlers in Noah. I did not realize Extreme Tiger was 41 yeah. until his nameplate popped up. I, I wonder how it was people like watching Wrestle Universe, like seeing Dragon Gate wrestlers for the same time and like being used to seeing like wrestlers, I guess, in late 20s to their 40s and Noah, then you used to see like nonstop 22, 20, 21, 23, 24, 26, you know? Yeah, world champion, 28 years old, doing pretty well for himself too. Indeed. And speaking of our world champion he teamed with the ghc heavyweight champion kaito kiyomiya versus kano and kota menonora kano won with the kieran moonsault double stomp or double knees on kiyomiya and this was fun i would say that this was not like feeling like a dragon gate match but this was a fun main event i like this case i thought it was fine i i I don't know. I wanted this match to be more fun. To me, it was just a vehicle for Kiyomiya versus Kano, which looked not a bad thing. If I was at Noah, I would probably do the same thing, especially because you have more eyeballs in Cork and Hall than you've ever had on a Noah show this year. So I get why they really wanted to go hard at that. I, I guess my big takeaway was seeing Kiyomiya and Yoshioka next to each other. I thought Yoshioka hung with them. You know, I thought they both looked like credible top guys, but... I don't know. This match didn't do a lot for me either. This was a show full of three star matches and then the one three and three quarter semi main event. Yeah, I guess for me, like, I enjoy this because this is what I was expecting. This felt like, okay, you put your world champions on one side, you put one of their rivals and their next challenger here. I guess you don't put Mochizuki here because I don't know how Noah unit affiliations work, but I don't think he like teams with Kano. I, but that's still like, this is a special show. You put the challengers versus the champions. But the, the a big seal of approval for Kota Menora, like putting him in that spot here, you know, I mean, the the fact that like this was so much around uh, uh, Kano and Kiyomiya that you could have probably put a lot of people in that spot there, but they put Kota Menora there, I think further kind of like gives us more indication about his long term directory uh, coming out of this because I know like y you brought up questions about oh, sh should we see, like, the, the Minonora pullback and how the Minonora pullback's going to happen? I think that, like, even with a pullback, like, him in this main event, I think, is a big sign that, like, not being scared about what happened this summer. I have zero complaints about how they've used him since August 2nd, 2022. I, I am a really big fan of the pullback, and I think this was the perfect kind of soft launch back into the main event scene for him. Yeah, and uh, I, I had a note that I was going to go on a tangent, and it was going to be about Mich Michinoku Pro Theory, that the people that work best with uh, Dragon Gate wrestlers are the ones that were in Michinoku Pro at one point, speaking of Kano and then Hao, but Hao didn't necessarily have the performance that I would would, uh, would lend evidence to my theory. But uh, yeah, it, it's something Kano always works with these guys, even works well with these guys, even if it, the match that the Dragon Gate guys were completely secondary. Oh, Kano's awesome. I mean, I the, the logistics of him jumping wouldn't make any sense, and I think it's something we would get tired of very quickly, but I kind of wish in the same way that Masaki Mochizuki works in Noah, I kind of wish Kano had that deal for Dragon Gate. Yeah, that would be really fun. But yeah, he's just fun whenever he's around. Yeah, and he kind of like the, like the whole thing with him and Kota Menonora on the mic afterwards. Like, one Menonora is like, like again like since August. Like, that's the kind of stuff you want to kind of see this. But like, that was like the like the biggest uh, case of someone who gets uh, who gets the audience he's playing to. Yeah, being that how many Dragon Gate fans came out to that, you know? Yeah, it's it's a fascinating show. I. I really did not enjoy it. I did not enjoy the idea. I did not enjoy the build. I did not enjoy the overall result, and I'm glad it's behind us, but it will be a fun thing to look back on a few years from now. Yeah, it, it, it will be it will be like an interesting like thing. Like I wonder like because of like the DDT D Dragon Gate shows that happen like in I I'm, forget, I'm forgetting, but it, it was 2008 and then two, 2008 and then 2012. Yeah, D2G, like, like this kind of like 
in a way i i wonder if it's going to be remembered in like a way that like d2g is now more known for what happened with tozawa and dino more so than anything else like i don't know if there was a moment here that that like other than like sickos like us doing whatever a podcast is in eight years going back and go like dragon gate and noah did this joint show what's the deal with that like i'm interested to see where this falls into like and historical relevance because i could see this just being completely forgotten in a few years well for those shows i mean the 2008 main event is great it's a six-man tag with some new hazard guys against gdt and it's really good and then the 2012 show has hulk versus ibushi which is a lot of fun and then uh that is is kondo on that show no, Kondo's on the Gaiora 20th anniversary show, but the, the second DDT show has Hulk versus Ibushi, and there was nothing on this show the level of that match. Yeah, so, like, I, I, I guess, like, when we talk about, like, context, like, I feel like that that's where the context, the, like, its point of comparison is, is that, and kind of surprised that I completely forgot about D2G until after this show happened instead of in the lead up to it. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I, I really hadn't made the comparison either, but I, I just think my enthusiasm for this show was so low that I, I tried not to think about it as much as I could. Yeah, no, and it's something that I guess coming out of it, it'll be interesting to see it, if there is like a quantifiable like rise of like Noah fans going over to Dragon Gate. So like the Noah fans who saw the Dragon Gate wrestlers at this show, like if there is like a bump there or if this is just something that happens and people were possibly paid for, and we move along our merry way. Yeah, I don't I don't see this show making any new fans for either promotion. I think I think they're just gonna move and go go on with their lives. Unless people are really shipping Kano and, and, Men- and Menorah. That could be a possibility. We can't discount that. That's that, that you're you're right. I mean that's a legitimate possibility that I I, I guess we can't we can't totally write off, but I, I, I don't know. Th- this, to me, was just a failed experiment on every level. I did not enjoy it. Yep, and I, I think that's probably... I think I'm probably ready to put Global Dream to bed in this episode of Open the Voice Gate. Case, okay, so do you have anything else you want to hit on before we got out of here? I did not. Nope. Uh, we still haven't really figured out what we will be doing up until the Hiroshima shows. There's a lot of stuff that's kind of come out. I know that mm-hmm. King of the Indies is this weekend, Case. Fun. So. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I'm really stoked about it as well. We'll, we'll. we'll talk and we'll get stuff together for the next few weeks. But thanks for listening to Open the Voice Gate. If you want to follow us on Twitter, we are at Open Voice Gate. Uh, take a look at our YouTube clip. I'll have it in the show description. And uh, just uh, help out uh, Joan Rich over at YouTube. Get, put, click subscribe. Do the bell button. Do those things. And at the very least, you, you'll be getting all the shows on the network and clips i know that more shows are going to be trying to do that as well and please rate and review us on the podcast platform of your choice that actually is the biggest help for podcasts and people finding the show so apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify rate and review but you can follow us on twitter open the voice gate cases at underscore in your case i'm at fujiheya thanks for listening to the voice gate we'll be back next week talking about dragon gate take care